chilliest of greetings to you, and welcome to Happily Ever Teaching! <laughs> this is the podcast to help you enthrall your learners in every subject under the sun using the best teaching method known to science, storytelling. To do this, we feature special guest educators who are passionately keen to empower your children. I am storyteller Chip Cahoon, and with me today is... Hi, I'm Abby, and I work for Festival Bridge as Education Programme Manager, and I used to be a primary school teacher in early years in Key Stage 1. Hi, I'm Rob, I work in Key Stage 2 in a school in Buckinghamshire near Milton Keynes. And today we are exploring what science we can teach with a spine-tingling story from Scotland. You can listen to the story by downloading our sister podcast, Fables and Fairy Tales, or search our website, epictales.co.uk, for Scottish Skeleton. That's not the title of the story, by the way. That's just the easiest way to find it. There you'll find a video of me telling the story that you can share with your children. And if you're an epic educator, as of 14th of October 2022, you'll also get the story as a paperback, eerily illustrated by Corky Paul, no stranger to spooky tales himself, in time for you to use for Halloween 2022. Don't worry if you missed that, though as you can also order the book from any bookshop, including Amazon, and Epic Educators can access the ebook and full audiobook through the Epic Tales app. In fact, I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone who's signed up to be an Epic Educator so far, because by doing so, you are also supporting this podcast so we can keep sharing these off-the-shelf lesson ideas every week. Right now, though, let's continue our discussion with Abby and Rob, the laddie and cool Johnny. And I don't know, you probably wouldn't immediately think of science when you're dealing with the supernatural or the paranormal. But uh, what science have you folks been able to pick out for your young learners? Again, we'll start with ages four to seven. What have you found for us, Abby? I actually didn't find it as challenging as you'd think, because okay. I think... The image of a skeleton almost sometimes is the image that people use when they're going to study biology. We're going to talk about science. Oh, course, so a skeleton yes. for me resonates really well with science. So I thought about <laughs> skeletons, but I took a slightly new angle and thought about the fact that we really want to encourage good examples of diversity in our teaching. Mm -hmm. And we probably, when we show an image of a skeleton, particularly if it's taken from a drawn image from Google, I bet it doesn't have amputees on there or people uh. who actually their skeleton is not what we probably see on Halloween costumes and other things. So I think yes. it's a really great opportunity to teach about the human skeleton. And in the science curriculum in Key Stage 1, you've got to identify, name and draw those body parts. But actually, wouldn't it be wonderful to use the opportunity to go, well, someone who's in a wheelchair doesn't have the exact same skeleton. So mm. it might be that someone who's an amputee and in a wheelchair doesn't have them, but someone who's not an amputee might have the skeleton, but they don't have the full use of their legs. Yes, so it will yeah. bring about a really interesting conversation about how the body works, what stops the body from working. And I just think it's a really sensitive way of both learning about your own body, but learning about the bodies of others. Mm, yeah, that's a really exciting idea. I like it. When we're talking about bones, I'd want real x-rays. So this is mm. one of those times where you you find out in your community of parents and guardians, is there anyone who works in a hospital? Is there anyone who might have access to the genuine article, real things that can be shared? Yeah. Finding those people with a science awareness and background. Mm. It would also be lovely, I think, to maybe draw some comparisons with the skeletons of ancient humans or mm. previous Homo erectus to see how it's developed because there will be some differences there too, won't there? And I'm sure that with those young people who are fascinated with digging up dinosaur bones, that there's a little bit mm. of a, okay, what's a human bone? And how do we know when you have found, say, the famous people who've been excavated in our country over the years, and it's been revelationary because they found kings and different people like that. But mm. how do they know they've found a person? And how do they know they've found 
a dinosaur or or other yeah. type. So you could have a compare and contrast with bones. And that links very well to the story, actually, doesn't it? Because when the laddie holds up a bone to the aunt, she's able to very quickly twig that it is a human bone. Um, why? How? Why, why doesn't mm. she think, oh, this might have come from a dog or this might have come from yeah. uh, a chicken? Or a T-Rex. <laughs> or, or a T-Rex, indeed. Yes. Yeah, yeah I, the comparison of um, animal skeletons and human skeletons comes into the key stage T correctly. Okay. So looking at animals and other humans. So definitely, how do we know that this is a human bone? What is different about it? And then starting to identify the names of some of the key parts of a skeleton. Not every single bone, because that would take quite a long time. But mm-hmm. uh, And then what are the functions of those bones? What is the function of the skeleton? Why do we have one? You could start comparing animals that have skeletons to animals that don't have skeletons in the same way that we do. Yeah. Or look at animals like snails and slugs. Do they have a skeleton in the same way that we do? What about snake? That wriggles around. Does it have a skeleton? And then mm. start looking at animals that have exoskeletons as well, as where they've got the skeleton on the outside. Mm-hmm. But just kind of looking at not only the purpose of the skeleton, but how is it different? How is it the same for different creatures around the world? Yeah. And the other idea that I thought of was to do with sound. Okay. When Johnny meets people, he shrieks at them, mm. kind of get out, don't come back. So I thought, well, we could use this to explore how sound not only travels, but how it gets into our body, where it goes when it's in our body, what is the effect of having a louder sound? Does that mean that we can hear it from further away or not? Posing different kind of questions about that. So building your investigative science into it as well. And Rob, that does lead into your music with your your tone and pitch as well. So you could have the young people all creating this lovely soundscape of horrific Halloween noises and (laughs) some could be really high-pitched howls and some could be really low ghoulish yeah. sounds and yeah and uh, but they'd have to really listen to one another so yeah i think that's that's another really fun one isn't it we're having a lot of fun with halloween and yeah, people are going to be walking past your classrooms and not sure whether to go in or <laughs> stay away <laughs> they'll be frightened away chip i've remembered can you remind me of the lines in the story about skeletons don't have so it's like skeletons don't have eyelids but yeah so skeletons don't have eyelids so they can't usually blink but somehow johnny managed to find a way he puffed his cheeks out as well that's it yeah, yeah. skeletons so, don't usually have cheeks okay so what i was thinking from those excerpts of text that you wrote the skeleton doesn't have this so it, it's again it's that scientific knowledge skeletons don't have eyelids skeletons don't have cheeks but then Mm. convert it into creative activity. So it's linked to science. You've got to do that groundwork first, but using their own Halloween character so they could have a zombie uh, Mm -hmm. and really think about the the material. They could have a slime monster and they could start talking about, okay, my slime monster doesn't have feet, but it can do this. So maybe something around materials, which you study in science anyway, but keep coming back to that creative thinking Mm. with this story. So sort of also exploring creature movement and expression. Mm, But you'd have to have those initial body parts, wouldn't you? Yes, yeah. I suppose uh, an interesting one on on that subject, Abby. Ghosts don't have lungs. And in fact, vampires don't have working lungs. So how can they talk? How can they be heard? How can they scream? And actually, do they have a digestive system? How can they drink blood? Uh, Yeah, very good point. (laughs) All of these questions, we were waiting desperately for Buffy the Vampire Slayer or Twilight or someone to answer, and they never did. (laughs) But a good scientist is curious and asks questions. And if using some of those, you know, fun, typical Halloween creatures to get them to ask those questions, they don't have to be answered, but if they think enough about what typifies those characters, then they're they're actually really doing some quite deep learning. Mm. 
That's sadly all we have time for in this episode, folks, and indeed this week. If you'd like to talk to us about anything you've heard in this podcast, or if there's a subject you're soon to teach that you'd like us to cover, you can find us on social media using at Teach Happily, or leave us a review using your favorite podcast app. Please also share this podcast with your colleagues and help us start a story-led revolution in classrooms around the world, so children everywhere can learn in a way that's effective, memorable, and enjoyable all at the same time. We'll be back next week, so call Johnny and the laddie can help us plan lessons in design and technology, geography, modern foreign languages, art, and physical education. Right now, though, it only remains for us to say cheerio, and we hope to hear your story soon. So, cheerio! And we hope to hear your story soon! Cheerio.